Hey everybody, welcome to the Multifamily Legacy Podcast. You guys are in for a treat today. I have a very, very special guest that has, I mean, when I say a ton of knowledge, I mean, the guy is really knowledgeable. I think you're going to be impressed with his analytics and his data, but um, Neil Bawa is, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, affectionately known as the mad scientist of multifamily, and he's a, a technologist and entrepreneur, and he's in love with the power of numbers to create profit for his real estate investors. He is the CEO and founder of, and I'm going to, I'm going to kill this. How do you say it? Grow, Grow Capitus. Well, just like it's spelt, Grow mm -hmm. Capitus, <laughs> a commercial real estate investment company. Um, Neil has um, well over a thousand uh, plus investors. Forget about units. Um, his uh, court, uh, current portfolio is over 2000 units in beds, um, over $150 million in, um, uh, uh, Prior, uh, value of his of his uh, portfolio and so neil welcome to the show brother thanks so much for having me on the show i've always wanted to be on the kahuna podcast and i finally get my chance thanks to that that meeting in in dallas yeah you know it's so funny we were talking about um you know just podcasts in general and a lot of them are not teaching um mm -hmm. sometimes you know it's great to have guests on but like we want guests to bring value and um and really you got to disrupt it a little bit and yep, that's really what yep. we were talking about before we even started was um, the the dirt, right? Yep. yep. So let's talk. About, let's let's just jump right into it. Or first of all, let's kind of back up. Let's mm -hmm. give me your quick success story, and then let's talk about data, and um, and, and then we're going to go into markets. How does that sound? Sounds good. So uh, I'm a technologist. I'm a, I'm a data geek, a self-professed data geek, and that's how I ended up with that mad scientist and multifamily nickname. Um, and I got into real estate in reverse. I uh, was uh, in technology running a company with hundreds of employees, and the company needed new campuses to be built. So unlike most people who start with single-family rentals, I actually started with a you know multi-million dollar campus that we built in Fremont, California in 2003, and we followed up with a bigger campus in 2006 and did an informal syndication because we didn't have enough money to build that bigger campus, so we kind of aggregated money. I didn't know the word syndication even existed back then, so it probably <laughs> broke every SEC rule that was ever written, but the intent was not to do real estate. It was just to basically build up our business. And then starting 2008, I started investing in uh, single families. I bought 10 single family homes in California. Uh, that went really well. Then I got overconfident. I went to Chicago and I bought 10 uh, triplexes there. And that was a horrible mistake. I bought in a absolutely distressed market. And I realized that and I, I basically found um, a huge number of offshore resources in the Philippines to basically lease up those properties. So I became a, a leasing expert. So you can you can say good things came out of bad things. And I, I also wrote a course called a Real Focus. It's a real estate demographics course that teaches you how to invest in the best cities and neighborhoods in the U.S. And I stuck that on Udemy.com, and it sort of went you know supernova. And there's three or four thousand people taking the course at any point in time. But it truly does, in 90 minutes, turn you into an expert on real estate. You you never even need to go there. You you, you end up learning how do you, everything. How do you get to it? Can we just plug it now? Yeah, so uh, that course is Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y dot com slash real focus. It is a truly free course. It doesn't ask you to upsell anything. It doesn't ask you to give your email address to me. It It, it is basically the result of my frustrations having purchased in, in, in South Chicago in a really horrible area, everything I learned, I poured the, the, the learning into it. And it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful course. And I can tell you more about it if, if it's appropriate for this podcast. Oh, man. Well, no. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I love that stuff. Like, listen, anytime anybody's just sharing the real stuff. And like, so, because, I mean, if you really back up for a minute, what you just said is what happens to, to real investors. You come and you start doing some stuff and you get some success and you're like, let's try it in a different spot or let's try to do something different. And sometimes we get our butts handed to us. Yeah. And it doesn't and feel I think that good. happens more often than not for new investors, right? It almost seems like everybody needs that to happen. And I don't think it needs to happen. I lost, you know, uh, a quarter million to a half million dollars of my personal money in Chicago. Uh, not because I, I was, you know, I, I lost that money, but I lost opportunity in, in better places. Exactly. And my, the value of my properties would have gone up. So I still count it as a loss, even though I broke even. Yeah. So, but I mean, but the, the breaking even is, but it's, and then you have to solve the problem. And it's in solving your net, that problem that you created for yourself. That is, I mean, and then now you're, and you've taught millions, right? So mm -hmm. like that's, yep. Yep. 
So, so uh, let me tell you about the system itself. So yeah. I call the system real focus. One thing I realized early on is demographics controls everything in real estate. And most people are looking at the roof and the foundation and they're looking at basically what the property looks like and they don't understand that their fate is really uh, driven by demographics. So I give my, my students, I, I'd also teach boot camps about this. The course itself is free. I give my students five city uh, focuses that they should understand. And I also give them five for neighborhoods. So I tell them, okay, first figure out which cities you want to go in. You want to figure out the best cities, the worst cities. Well, apply these five focuses. The first focus is very simple. It is population growth. And I tell people, it's not important that you should have population growth. It's important to know how much population growth. So I tell people, go to Google, type in the name of your city. Let's say you're investing in Columbus, Ohio, type in Columbus, Ohio, hit enter. And then look at basically the population growth over the last 16, 17 years, you want to have 20% population growth in a city that you're investing in. So Columbus is a perfect example of a city that meets that. Detroit is an example of a city that doesn't meet it. St. Louis is an example of a city that doesn't meet it. Dayton, Ohio is a city that doesn't meet it. A lot of you know cities that are popular for investment, Atlanta, Phoenix, Orlando, crush that number because they've had tremendous growth uh, in the last, uh, um, you know, uh, 15 to 17 years. Why 15 to 17 years? Because it's very easy to get data on the web from 2000 to 2017. So I use that as my benchmark and I say over the last 17 years, you want to have about 20% population growth. Wow. Now, if you get that 20% population growth, and you will, you, you'll notice cities that are over that threshold. What, what does that lead to? Well, it needs to uh, increases in people's income. Because as more people cram into an area, that tends to boost the incomes in that area up. Right. So so what is the income level? Right. So the next next principle, the second principle is you want the income levels in the in the city that you're investing in to increase by 30 percent in that same time frame, 2000, 2000 to 2016, 2017. That time frame, instead of a 20 percent increase, you need a 30 percent increase in the actual income levels. Now, where do you get that data? Right. So it's easy to talk about data, but you have to get it from somewhere. What is really, really simple. There's a website, it's called city-data.com. That's city-data.com. Go in there, type in your favorite city, whatever city you wanna experiment with, right? So I, I type in Columbus, Ohio in all of my examples, and I hit enter, and you scroll down a little bit, and it'll show you median household income. It'll show you a, a line. And you'll notice that there's two numbers. There's the number, the latest number, and then there's a number in 2000. All you have to do is figure out the delta between those two numbers. If the delta, between those two numbers is 30% or over, that's a great city to invest in. Boom. It doesn't matter the size. It right. doesn't, it could be as big as Los Angeles, it could be as small as, you know, as Deltona Beach. But that this number, the 30% income growth number is critical for your success as a real estate investor. So that's my And I focus say, because I want to say why. Well, right. uh, to me, so the, the, the big, the immediate question is why, what, what does that give you, right? What does that income growth give you? And the answer to that question is it gives you home price increases. When people, if their income increases by 30%, they're able to afford home prices. So actually no, the, the second focus now leads me to the third focus. The third focus is you want that city that you're investing in, in that same time frame, the 2000 to 2016, you want its home prices. Again, I, I know we're apartment guys, but for a moment, right. you know, it, it works just as fine. The home we're prices. Talk, we're just talking data right now. Like this is data. Just talking stuff. data, and it works. What I'm what I'm saying works perfectly fine for big multifamily or small single family. Does there's no difference, right? Because we're just talking about the right places to invest in, and those are right for single family and multifamily. So the third real focus is, in that same time frame. We talked about 20% or greater population growth. We talked about 30% or greater income growth. We, well, what we want is 40% or greater home prices growth, right? So your home price growth shouldn't be 20 or 30. It should be 40 in that same uh, time frame. And you might say, okay, well, where do I get that data? Well, remember that city dash data page that you type Columbus, Ohio, or whatever city into, yep. and you saw the median household income? Well, one inch below that line is another line that says home or condo value. And it also has two numbers. It has the number in 2000 and it has the most recent number. So there's the delta. That figure out the delta. If that delta is over 40%, you're in a good place. Columbus, Ohio is 40%. Orlando is 80%. Phoenix is 70%. So there's a lot of 
a lot of metros in the US that'll meet it, but then there's a lot of metros that won't meet this number. Those are the ones you have to be careful about. And I'll, I'll talk about where you break the rules. These, because these are not rules, they're rules of thumb. And, and rules, of, rules of thumb are meant to be bent, but I'll give you some examples on where to bend and where not to bend. But let's complete the, the other two real focuses first. Yeah. Right? I'm so having a blast, about, dude. This is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it truly works. I mean, if you go to the Udemy website, you'll see how it's changed people's lives. People are posting reviews about how they've used the system. They're posting reviews about where they bought the property and how much more money they're making by using the system, right? So, and it's completely free. There's everything that I've told you, you can go and start using it. You don't need to buy anything from me or from anyone else. It's yeah. meant to be given away. So, we talked population growth, we talked you know, income growth, and we talked about home price growth. The fourth real focus that you need to look for is crime. And not crime, but reduction in crime. Reduction in crime. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, that same city dash data page that you're already on for that favorite city of yours, I want you to scroll down. It's gonna be many feet. So keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and eventually you'll come to this big table. And that table says crime statistics for whatever your favorite city is. Well, I want you to ignore the whole big table and go to the very last row of the table, and that row is blue in color. So ignore all the rows, go to the blue row. And what I want you to do is, on the, the, in the blue row, the number on the right, the absolute far right, which is the most recent number, make sure that number is below 500. So that is the city data crime index. Crime and you want to yeah. invest in a city where the number that is most recent, you'll, you'll see the years, you'll see a table that says 2003, 2004, 2006, 2017, the most recent number, make sure it's below 500. And then I want you to do one additional thing, which is look at the entire row going from left to right. Make sure that there's a smooth decline in crime. In all of my research, the one thing that I figured out is this, home prices go up in every city as crime goes down. I have never found this there to be an exception to this rule. Home prices are inversely correlated with crime. And because home prices are going up, your rents are also going to go up because rents are tied to home prices in a certain market. Exactly. And so in my mind, there's no better indicator than reduction in crime. Now, there's also, there. I don't have a real focus for this, but I, I wanna give you this piece of information. Home prices are also tied to education and crime decreases as education increases. So cities that have great universities tend to have a decline in crime, which means that they also have lower cap rates, right? So that's usually good for us when we're buying multifamily, you wanna buy something in a market where the cap rates are going to keep decreasing over the next 10 years, because that the prices are going to increase in your favor as an investor. Doesn't matter if you're buying a single family or a 200 unit, both of those, it's in your favor if crime's decreasing. So let me give you examples. Columbus, Ohio, the 2003 number is going to be close to 800. That's a bad number. That's a very rough city to invest in. But right. you know what you'll notice is each year that number is dropping in Columbus, Ohio because of Ohio State, because of all the healthcare systems they've put in, because of all the businesses coming into Columbus. And you're going to keep seeing that that number is dropping, 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 dropping. And today it's dropped below 500. It's actually at 414 for the most recent year, right? Compare that to some of the other cities that are very rough, like Memphis, still way above that 500 number. Right. Uh, Detroit, well above that 500 number. Oakland, California, well above that 500 number. Doesn't mean you can't make money in Detroit. That is not what I'm talking about. Right. What, what I'm saying is it is much harder for you to find good properties. If you're gonna go Detroit. fishing in a pond, pick some, pick the right ponds to begin with. Exactly, right? Right. Don't, don't go against the flow, right? So another way of describing this system is this, okay? So you're in a plane and that plane is flying to Corey Peterson's house and it's flying at 550 miles an hour, okay? But now all of a sudden you have a 200 mile headwind, okay? Well, guess what? Your plane's not flying at 550. It's now flying at 350, right? Because yeah. the wind is pushing it back. Well, if you use the real focuses, instead of the wind pushing you back in places like Detroit, you're now finding cities where there's a 200 mile headwind. Yeah, and you so just flip the plane, plane around, now you're going. At your, now you're going 750 an hour, not 350 an hour. 
So you've more than doubled your speed, which means that you're going to surprise Corey by showing up at his house much sooner than you're supposed to. <laughs> way, you may get a surprise when you do that. <laughs> Corey's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Weren't you supposed to show up, you know, two hours from now? Well, in the same way, you can get your returns instead of five years. You can get to them in two or three years because you have these demographic tailwinds, right? A 20% population growth is a massive tailwind. 30% income growth, 40% home price growth. A reduction in crime is a massive tailwind. The last tailwind, the last real focus at the city level is jobs, right? And when we look at jobs, we don't look at the last 15 years of jobs. Trust me, that is a bad way to look at jobs. We simply look at the last 12 months because what jobs do is they create a frenzy in a market. They create a frenzy. They drive up home prices. And every time home prices go up, a certain percentage of people get priced out of the market and now they have to rent and they are your customers. Yeah, so market, it's happening in Phoenix right now. Yeah, Phoenix is a perfect, perfect example of the job market basically driving people who could have bought homes now into the, the multifamily market. And it's the affluent multifamily market because this guy's not poor. He almost had enough money to buy that single family home. He was almost there, but then the prices went up another 5% and basically he got priced out. So what he's going to do is he's not going to go buy old units. He's going to go into a nice multifamily with nice rehab units, hopefully one that is owned by you, right? Or a nice single family rental home that is hopefully owned by you. So remember, the concept here is it doesn't matter whether it's multifamily or single family. When you get these tailwinds, you get massive increases. All of a sudden, you look like a freaking genius, right? Right, yeah. The mistakes that you're doing are hidden because the tailwind is hiding all of your mistakes. But you just, right? yeah, oh yeah, exactly. Well, not only right. that, I mean, but I love this idea of just taking what the market's giving and finding the markets that are giving the most. Like and those markets are giving all the time, right? Again, the, the, the beauty of it is everything's easier. Your delinquency is lower. Your, 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 um, your occupancy is longer. Your rent increases have to be higher. I mean, that's, exactly. where, that's where I'm you're, thinking you're that it really rents happens. rents like crazy, right? It's so much crazier. And you're like, well, why don't I just go look, look at rent growth? No, by looking at these metrics, you understand future rent growth. This is right. a crystal This is ball. going to create the rent growth that you're looking for that would make- it Creates the rent growth. Rent growth is the final, it, it is the outcome of these things. And when you look at the core itself, you can predict the future, 18, 24 months into the future. Let me give you an example. And I wanna give you a, a, an actual URL because people are like, okay, so jobs, but where the hell do I get job data for? Right. Well, I, I've looked at lots of different job websites. My favorite actually is a website called Department of Numbers. So it's D-E-P-T of numbers.com, D-E-P-T of numbers.com slash employment slash metros. And I'm going to type this in here and, and, and Corey yeah, can share. Yeah, we will make sure we put this in the show notes. So yeah, trust so, me, if you're listening right now and you, you're driving, don't right. worry. Come back to the podcast or uh, you know go to the show notes. It will all be there. Right. So here it is. So I'm, I'm, I just chatted it over to you. Right. And so when you go to this page, this is an amazing page, right? It is the most recent numbers for employment for every goddamn metro in the U.S. Big, small, tiny, doesn't matter. And on this page, there are four columns. I want you to ignore all of them. Go right to the, to the right column and you sort it. It's the one year job percentage change. Remember, jobs are not important. Change in jobs is important. Growth in jobs is important. So on this page, there, that, there, the last column is the percent change column. Click on it, and it'll give you basically the best and worst markets in America. In my mind, what are the worst markets in America? Lafayette, Indiana, a negative job growth of 5%. Huma, Louisiana, Morgantown, West Virginia. Now you start seeing, hearing all about all of these Rust Belt cities, right? Mun Muncie, or Munchie, I don't know how to pronounce it, in Indiana, Michigan City, Indiana, Youngstown, Ohio. These, these are all cities that are losing massive numbers of jobs. And I'm, I'm scratching my head going, why would anybody want to invest in a place that loses jobs when the country is at 3% unemployment? Imagine what's going to happen to this place when we hit a recession, right? Yeah, that, right. That unemployment rate is going to go to 20 or 30 or 40 or some crazy number, right? So stay away from these sorts of places regardless of what sort of deal you're being offered because I bet you there's lots of turnkey providers offering properties in these markets. But on the other hand, look at markets like Reno, Nevada, St. George, Utah, right? Here's a rule of thumb that you should, you should know about as a, as a real, real estate investor. 2% job growth usually gives us about 2% rent growth. And we're okay with that, you know, 2% rent growth is all right. 
3% job growth tends to give you about 3% rent growth. And we're happy at 3%. We're pretty happy as apartment owners because yes. you can double investor money in five years with 3% rent growth and, and, and your rehab budget, right? At 4%, you're ordering champagne bottles. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. We're cutting the rug here. We're doing the jig at 4%. At brother. 5%, you're doing the naked dance with a champagne bottle, right? <laughs> And there are markets in the United States continuously at 5% job growth on this damn page. St. George, Utah, Reno, Nevada, Gainesville, Georgia, Columbus, Indiana, not Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Indiana, Auburn, Alabama, Carson City, Nevada, Provo, Utah, Asheville, North Carolina, Cape Coral, Fort, Fort Myers, uh, uh, Florida, Orlando, Phoenix. These markets may not be at five, but they're at four. And what they're giving you at four, you've got that 200 mile headwind at five. That's a three or 400 mile tailwind to your to your plane. I mean, your 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 plane's now going supersonic. Right. And, and, and all of a sudden, again, all of this, your investors are thinking you're some freaking genius. You're just looking at this page. That's, it, That's my how friend. powerful data is. Right. Drop I, the mic, Neil. <laughs> it, it is. It, that is how powerful it is, guys. I tell you. Data is the oil of the 21st century. And when you when you were born in Texas 50 years, you couldn't help being, being rich, but it took you a lot of effort. You had to go find the oil, drill the oil, sell the oil. Here in 60 minutes, you turn into a freaking genius. Why wouldn't you want you to use this? You can be a mad advantage? scientist too in the multifamily. It, it, Follow I, you. I, I tell you, the, <laughs> that, that's, you, know, you, you said it already, Corey. I am in love with the power of numbers to create wealth. When I invest in something like St. George, a market that is at 99.2% occupancy, 99.2%, right? Yeah. There is no such thing as concessions in the city of St. George. They laugh at you, <laughs> right? No one's even given out a $25 Starbucks gift card to sign somebody on. That's how good of a market it is. Right? So let us let me play devil's advocate on this, right? So sure. on those bigger MSA markets, like let's, we'll use, I live in Phoenix, so let's use Phoenix. Sure. How then when you're buying something and you're looking at cash flow, you're like, gosh, I may not be cash flowing in year one or um, what's the take on that? Just say, okay, well then, you know, you got to have a five year outlook because that the pace of what's going to go on is going to catch up or. I think so. The, the, the truth is this, when you're starting out, let's say you're, you're, you're doing this on your own. You are your own investor, yep. right? Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to model out the much higher rent growth that Phoenix will give you over a five year, year or time, seven year performer. Yep. Then I want you to model out using this jobs page that I just gave, gave you much lower rent growth in, a, in another market, right? right? And that market is giving you cash flow. Maybe it's uh, Cleveland, Ohio or Dayton, Ohio, right? right? So use Dayton as your example and then use uh, you know Phoenix as an example. Be, just don't put in the same rent growth in Dayton that you would put in Phoenix. That right. is cheating, right? right? So you, you got to basically look at the job growth numbers and the you got to really look at the data. Growth. This exactly. is what you're talking then, about because this is the data. Because so I'm doing this to, to make a point, uh, right? Because and I'm going to let you know that I've had this mentality for a long time, Neil. Like you've you've already had this discussion, and I've been really paying attention um, for a while now. And I'm just like I've always said, oh gosh, I'm just a Midwest um, South kind of investor, right? And mm -hmm. I just take my little cash flow deals and they work, but it's the back end that I never get that huge back end. The three X, the four X. Right? Oh my God. Right. And I know that that happens in Phoenix. Yeah. Without it a happens doubt. in Phoenix. It happens in Orlando. It's, it's happening in Boise city. It ha it's happening in Provo, Utah. I mean, these people, these places have enormous back ends because they're low cap markets. Yes. You're not getting the rent growth in the first year, but to me, what I do is I, I condition my investors to, look, we've got to invest in better markets. And then I, I kind of vary my deals. I'll do one that has you know higher cash flow, but I'll keep telling, messaging my investors about these great markets. And I basically convince them that these are good markets. You're to showing invest. them the way, right? Yeah. Which, which exactly. is all about data. Like, guys, here's the business plan. It yields way much better at the end of the day if you want to look at the data, right? and say, well, you can go in the Midwest and you're gonna do this and you have a little cash flow, but like you're missing out on this other thing that's real was when you're gonna sell it, your exit. Yes, yes, but here's the, here's the coolest thing I'm gonna give you today. And this is really more for, for you because you know, you're an experienced indicator. There are markets in the Midwest 
at six, seven, eight cap that are in this list. For example, Columbus, Indiana is actually a very strong market that you should look at. Auburn, Alabama, these are all markets with 4% job growth in the Midwest with Midwest cap rates. It is possible for you to to have your cake and eat it too. Hey, I just want to go. I'm going to go to Phoenix now, Neil. Like, listen, I live here. I'm like, I'm going to drive out Phoenix my door. Phoenix is a phenomenal market, right? So, I mean, there, I, there's not much that I can say wrong about it. I'm doing a project in Mesa. It's about you know 10, 15 miles away from from Phoenix because Phoenix is from a 10 uh, year growth perspective the best metro in America. It's not going and to I, stop. There's so many people that move into the city. It, I've seen it. It cannot now. stop, right? So there is a website that I like to show people who say Phoenix is too expensive. Okay. If you think Phoenix is too expensive, I want you to spend the next three minutes doing exactly what I'm gonna tell you now. I want you to go to a website called weareapartments.org, and that is W-E-A-R-E, -E, I'm typing it in, apartments.org, right? And I want to go to this, I want you to go to this site, and then I, you, you'll notice that there's a bunch of different metros that you can pick, and I want you to pick like Pittsburgh. And I want you to look at the chart that shows the supply in Pittsburgh and the demand. And you're going to be like, oh, my God, I don't want to invest in Pittsburgh. Now, I want you to select Phoenix. And I want you to look at the supply in Phoenix and the demand. And notice just how massive the I already know. I live here through this. Huge. So here's what happened, right? So it is huge. I lived in this. What happened was when the market crashed, I mean, everything commercial stopped. stopped. And it, did, I mean, it didn't like ebb. It stopped for five to almost seven years. Yep. Just in the last three years, they've really got, and they're building all these apartments everywhere, but they are so far behind that they cannot catch up now. Exactly. It takes a long time to catch up. So Phoenix, in my mind, is one of those markets that needs to build at its current rate for six, seven, eight years for the market to, to catch up. Might even take longer because right. of inward but migration. What a good, yeah, uh, but using your data again. So this is, man, I'm loving this podcast, by the way, Neil. <laughs> right? I love, uh, you know, I've never, I've never looked at data quite like, I mean, I look at data a lot, but never quite in this fashion. And this is some, I mean, Neil is throwing out some cherry bombs here that um, you got to go look at all these websites that he's talking about and understanding this because I, I just, I know it's true because I've, I've been in, uh, like I was in one of my last deals that I, th uh, well, I did, I, I did a three X on it, right? I bought it for 3 million. I bought, uh, sold it for 8.8. .8. This is in South Carolina. Uh -huh. um, and it was just the particular market that was really hot because um, I didn't know at a time, but I, I, I guarantee you population was there the income and the home prices and because the, there was lots of new jobs being created as well and it mm -hmm. was a smaller little and dude we killed it killed yeah. it i think some of those smaller markets today are are better you know obviously phoenix has phoenix is an exceptional market right so right. i mean there's and, there's and maybe we say the greater phoenix, markets so like phoenix in the whole country around it. right yeah but if you're if you're looking at some of the smaller markets i really see a lot of opportunity there i mean i'm investing one of my favorite small markets is st george utah and it's a it's a two hundred thousand person metro you but you drive it through the canyon and you're out going. right yeah yeah i mean Three million people uh, come through to the national parks, and so the city is very affluent, and and um, you know it has uh, almost no delinquency, right? So I think that there's a lot of money. I mean, if uh, if if you know Utah's too far for you, look at Gainesville, Georgia. That's another market that is not considered a secondary area or a primary, but it's very very powerful. I think you you, you the, the job growth there is so insane that whatever you do, you'll be swept along. So. I, I tell people that uh, some of these markets are either singles, twos, or home runs. I mean, you're not going to strike out. And that's the name of the game. Listen, if you can go through, I mean, the real deal is like when you're when you're first starting out as a as a syndicator and raising capital and find you know trying to you know there's so many things you feel like you so many hats you got to put on, um, and you're always nervous as hell. And sometimes knowing that you're in the right market is the confidence factor that you need. To know that, because it would, just like you said, that tailwind can um, kind of mitigate a lot of sloppy mistakes that you that you might make on your first deal. Yeah, and then honestly, we make mistakes. I'm on my 15th deal. I still make mistakes. Yep. And so my that tailwind protects me no matter how experienced I get. I probably need it less now than I did in my first deal, but I still need it and I still benefit from it, right? And here's a question. Even if I don't need it, why wouldn't I want to benefit from it, yeah. right? 
why wouldn't I want to make more money for my investors? So I think that it, it behooves you as a syndicator or as a real estate investor buying a single family to really look at this data. Mm -hmm. I want to give you one, one final piece of information. I gave you five real focuses. Yeah. I want to give you five more for neighborhoods. Remember, all great cities have neighborhoods. Phoenix downtown, brilliant. One mile from Phoenix downtown is the county jail. You would not want to invest in that neighborhood. It is absolutely horrible. Point being, great cities have horrible neighborhoods. How do you prevent, how do you make sure that you're not investing in the wrong neighborhoods? Well, in this podcast, we don't have the time to go into it, but the good news is that Udemy course, and I'm going to type it in here, www.udemy.com slash real focus. Go in there, skip the entire first section about cities because you already got it right in this podcast. Yep. Go to the second section. And I'll give you five metrics for how to target down to a micro neighborhood level. And I bet you if you'd randomly pick 10 addresses in the US anywhere, maybe, maybe these are turnkey homes, you will notice one or two are excellent, one or two are good, five or six are totally horrible. And that's how powerful data is. Without getting onto a plane, without even doing a Google street view, you figure out everything about that area. And you can go back to that. I challenge you to do this. Go back to that turnkey provider and say, well, this is a shitty area because of these reasons. He is not going to dispute it. They are relying on you not knowing this data to sell these homes. I totally, totally agree. Neil, listen, uh, we're almost ready, uh, almost out of time, but I want to... I want to talk about real quickly lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. um, going into this business and looking where you started and where you're at now, can you tell the audience what the difference is in lifestyle and, and what it's done for you and your family? Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I just came back from a vacation in the Cayman Islands. So, so to me, I, I, I'm not into the expensive cars. You know, I do live in a, in a fancy house. Number one, I love working from my home, which is great. So I, I have 23 team members. They're all in different parts of the, the world. Um, and uh, the only time I put on a, a jacket is for the podcast. Right, right? yeah, or, or and I put on my Hawaiian shirt, so present. there that's, we go. That's it. I, mean, <laughs> I, think, I think it's freedom. The, I know money is important, and I know money will be important to you, but in the long run, I think the biggest thing that you gain is freedom, the ability to simply say, I'm off next week, or I'm off next month. So one of the gifts that I'm giving my business for 2020 or myself is I'm taking a month off. You know, we call it a sabbatical. I'm just basically going to plan a month. You know, my, my staff will manage my, the company and I'll take it off. Doesn't mean that I work any less hard. In fact, you know, I used to be a technologist and work for the same company for 16, 17 years. I think I work at just as hard. But number one, I have peace of mind. Nobody's firing me. Nobody's, you know, nobody's doing that. Number two, I'm building legacy wealth because a lot of my wealth is basically coming when my properties are being sold and that's yep. capital gains. And, and so I get to keep a lot of that money and not pay it to the, to the tax man. But I think the biggest thing is freedom, knowing that if tomorrow something happened, you know, my family's life would be better because of all this legacy wealth of properties that would be selling in the next 10 years. It gives me an incredible peace of mind. I think that I have... I, I believe I've achieved true happiness and money is only a part of that. It really C is brother. Control over your destiny is the biggest part of it. Man, you couldn't have said any better guys. Uh, listen, uh, for everybody that's just listening to this podcast, you just got a treasure trove of links of data of places to go. Neil gave you a course for free. Um, Neil, listen, uh, you know, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I've, you know, um, I know you've listened to the podcast before and to have you on a guest is very, very special to me. Um, guys, if you're listening, you know, the power of your mind is everything. Neil just talked about his lifestyle and the change and, and what it does for in his uh, family life. And it's really not about money. Money is a byproduct of what we do, but it's really not what defines us. It's really yeah. what's in between the two, your two ears, your mind. It's the most powerful tool that you will ever have, guys. And if you can believe it, you can achieve it. And your paradise is possible.